Well, <clears throat> as you know, juvenile laws uh, and, and are so forth, they are not really, juveniles generally are not technically charged, in my understanding, with a criminal offense. They're charged under juvenile justice provisions under having committed delinquent conduct or conduct in need of supervision, which could be a classified as an offense were they adults. So juveniles ages 10 to 17 absolutely could be prosecuted by local district attorneys under your law, correct? But I don't know what, what you're asking me. Well, uh, basically, I, if they were adults, but they're not, if they were adults, have they committed a criminal offense? And if they're, as a, as a minor, as a child, coming across, presumably with their parents or, or, or with someone that's not their parents, you know, they're not the age of majority where they can consent to certain actions that are done. I can't imagine a situation where we're actually prosecuting. So if you can't imagine it. Gentlemen's time has expired. Move to extend. There's a standing objection to the extension of time. There will be a record vote. Clerk will ring the bell. Show Mr. Spiller voting nay. Mr. Cook voting nay. Have all members voted? Mr. Smith voting nay. Have all members voted? Being 82 nays, 60 ayes, the motion fails. Chair recognizes Ms. Morales Shaw to close on her amendment. I do not agree with the author of this bill, Representative Spiller, that children will not be caught in this net from this bill. This is a safeguard to make sure that they will not be criminalized unintentionally. I do agree with the author of this bill that sh we should not be tinkering with federal law that is equipped to deal with immigrants and especially immigrant minors. Move adoption. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Sweener, Ms. Sweener, for what purpose? Will the gentlelady yield for some questions? Yes. The, gentle, the gentlelady yields. So Representative Morales Shaw, I, I feel like this got a little muddled while we were talking with the bill's author. I wanna be absolutely clear. As this legislation is written right now, the offenses of illegal entry and illegal re-entry could be used as a basis for juvenile delinquency and prosecuting minors, correct? I'm a 21 year lawyer. My understanding from reading the plain language of the bill, especially because it cites to 8 USC, which is the definite, which resorts to that because of its definition of alien, includes all people, including minors. And Representative Morales Shaw, I know the bill, bill author said he didn't think this was his intent. He said that he did not believe DPS would pursue prosecuting minors, but the implications of this bill and its enforcement are not limited to DPS, correct? Correct. The way so, it's written on its face value, does not have any exception for minors, which is what my amendment would do. It would protect minors from being recklessly criminalized. So right now we would hope that prosecutors using their discretion would generally not prosecute minors, but any prosecutor in the state of Texas could choose to prosecute an 11 year old under this bill as written without your amendment, correct? You and I both know that judges, magistrates, attorneys, prosecutors, DAs, county attorneys, follow the letter of the law, or that's what they're supposed to do. If they're following the letter of this law, they will incriminate minors. So you have a very clear option if we do not want to put 10 and 11 year olds in jail for crimes which they really can't have intent behind, we should accept your amendment, correct? Absolutely. Thank you for this excellent amendment, Rep. Morales Shaw. You're welcome. Speaker. Ms. Niavia Curado, for what purpose? Does the gentlelady yield for a brief question? Yes. The gentlelady yields. Thank you. Representative Penny Morales Shaw, thank you for your amendment. If the author just said that supposedly the children are not supposed to be included. Why else then would we include on page one language to specifically exclude a public or private 
primary or secondary school for educational purposes if we weren't mm -hmm. worried that minor children were going to be arrested under this bill? Exactly. There are other indicators besides that in the bill as well, like the uh, affirmative defense of DACA, which I appreciate the author adding that in. But there, there are a few different places in this bill that make us believe that minors were considered and their incrimination was considered. Thank you. But not excluded. Move adoption. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Show Ms. Morales Shaw voting aye. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There being 61 ayes and 81 nays, the amendment fails. Following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Ann Johnson of Harris. Chair recognizes Johnson of Harris. Mr. Speaker and members, what this um, amendment does is changes the punishment range from a third degree felony on page six, line 10, to a state jail felony. And I would ask that there are two considerations for why we might want to do this. One, you heard the scenario earlier about the strict liability nature of somebody that is across the border or brought across the border. And that strict liability statute gives you little to no um, ability to make a determination as to the gray between victim and offender. And so a state jail felony acknowledges a six months to two years period in prison for this act of coming across the border. Obviously, if you are a perpetrator and you are committing other offenses in conjunction with that, then you will also be prosecuted with those other offenses. And so in this respect, lowering this punishment range protects the potential individual who can be seen as both victim and offender because that may be the only violation that they have which is the strict liability offense of coming across the border. The second question that you get to ask is, how much do you want to spend on this? Because we've already heard many times over, this is a federal provision. This is normally something that is prosecuted by the feds, and that means the feds foot the bill. We are now taking this on and saying, hey, let's go for it. So what do you want to pay for? Do you want to pay for somebody to be here as a consequence of six months to two years before they're deported? Or do you want to pay for them to be here for two to 10 years? So in that respect, the punishment is the same. You're getting deported, you've been convicted, but how long do you want to physically house an individual when you can make the same impact on a state jail felony grade offense? So whether it's a victim or an offender, you have the opportunity to stack on different offenses if you need for punishment purposes, but this ensures that the state of Texas is imposing the least amount of taxpayer burden on the citizens of this state since we're paying for it both in state and federal provisions now. Mr. Moody, for what purpose? Will the gentlelady yield for a couple questions? Yes. Gentlelady yields. Okay, so I'm Your amendment covers the offense of, this is the offense of illegal entry? Yes, this is the offense of illegal entry 51.03. Okay. And it reduces it down to a state jail felony. And in addition to what we talked about, about potential victim status and others, I noticed that this provision under 
section one that's on line four has been denied admission. There's no provision in there that tracks the federal immigration provision that says whether or not you have uh, illegally entered and we're gonna put a bar of either three years or 10 years. So the state here is again, just and not only a strict liability offense, but an indefinite, what I'm gonna call statute of limitations on the, on the entry. And so again, we may, we may recognize this as more of a victim population. So, okay, so, and I wanna, I wanna pin that down because you, I know we touched on earlier strict liability and that's what we're dealing with here. And so unlike other offenses, uh, explain to me then what, what is the difference when we talk about a strict liability offense and as that kind of would be juxtaposed with, with other offenses with different mens rea? So typically we would look at a mens rea and we would set it out in the statute. And just as uh, Representative Gomez read out earlier, that the requirement here is that you enter illegally yep. and not through a port of entry. So that means entering through the border. It doesn't say knowingly or intentionally. And we've talked about that before on knowingly or intentionally. I think last session I did the example with tossing the egg. And if we toss the egg, depending on where we are, if we intentionally throw it at somebody, we can look at the circumstantial evidence in our body language to say, okay, they intentionally and knowingly. Or recklessly, that's another standard that we might have under criminal law that uh, I'm dancing wildly, right? I'm not paying attention to my circumstances. I'm intentionally dancing wildly and I happen to strike somebody, maybe that is an offense of assault. But here, a strict liability provision means the body entered the border. And so we talked about yeah. false imprisonment, kidnapping, being in the back of a tractor trailer. If you enter, there is no mens rea in my mind as the potential victim that I'm getting into the truck on purpose. You're, you're here, you're here, strict liability. And the way, that, the way that the penalty scheme works under SB4 is that begins as a class A misdemeanor and then we have aggravating factors that bump it up and they're straight to a third degree. And so what your amendment would do, which is typical, and I wanna stress, it, well, maybe, I guess I should ask stair questions. Step. Is it typical as we stair step up offenses that we, we do make a stopping point at state jail felony depending on certain aggravating factors? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And so if we think about the stair step of punishment, Class B misdemeanor, Class A misdemeanor, state jail felony, third degree, second degree, first degree. And again, this is just applying to the issue of entry. If the person has committed another offense along with the entry, then whatever the appropriate punishment range is for those other offenses, that would also be applied. So this is just looking at the potential individual whose only offense is the entry. There is a provision where you have a bump up in the bill as it came in uh, where an individual, if they've been convicted of two or more misdemeanors involving drugs, it, does, this, does this bill as it came to the floor define what level of misdemeanor or would that, would that include a class C paraphernalia charge? And again, Mr. Moody, I have read that as well. If you have the point, but I think you're right. If you say misdemeanor, a class C misdemeanor could potentially qualify if it, it's not restricted to class B or above. Well, it also says crimes against a person. That could be offensive touching. It could be. Okay, so. Presumably, right? So, and that's part of the question. So, and I, so, I, th so I think the policy, the, the policy initiative here is, is one that we encounter quite a bit when we work in criminal justice, which is right-sizing penalties and ensuring that as we have aggravating factors, the penalty is commensurate with the aggravating factors. Would you agree with me that Class C misdemeanor offenses probably do not rise to the level of a bump from a Class A to a third-degree felony? Correct. It's a high jump, and you do have an in intermediary step that one is not only a state jail felony of six months to two years, but for purposes of what we would normally think about on immigration law, it's a felony. Um, so there's no, bit, there's no reason to jump over state jail 
to get to the third degree. That, that's a point that I think people should, should, should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Felony is a felony. The repercussions for that individual are going to be the same either way, which there's going to be consequences at the federal level one way or the other. All you're doing, though, by keeping it as a third degree is you're probably you're obligating the state of Texas to bear the brunt of that cost, which it's been my understanding that's something we're, we're trying to avoid. You're going to pay for eight more years. So you're going to house, you're potentially going to house for eight more years. Do you want to pay for eight more years or do you want the person if you're if, if the goal is to enforce the deportation and send them back? then why would you want a provision that says we're going to we're sit gonna and house longer. you for longer? Yeah. And so, in, in, and I don't know if, if Mr. Spiller is, is uh, engaged in this conversation yet, but maybe there's something, if you want to stair step into a third degree, maybe there, maybe you want to say you were convicted of certain class B or above misdemeanors involving drugs, crimes against person, because then you're talking about yeah, you're talking about possession. You're talking. You're talking about uh, assault, domestic violence. You're talking. You, you are getting into the realm where maybe I think you can justify moving to a, a third degree felony. Whereas here, you are going to sweep up some fairly minor offenses because they're not distinguished between Class C and Class B, um, and and still subject someone to third degree felony, which to your point is going to put the burden on the state of Texas to continue to house these individuals for the entirety of whatever that sentence ends up being. Is that correct? Absolutely. General Lady's time has expired. Chair recognizes recognize Mr. Spiller in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, I'm in opposition to this amendment. Uh, it's really a philosophical difference as far as what you think the proper punishment, range of punishment would be for an offense some, such as this. But let me, let me put it in perspective from my view. Uh, the, uh, and for illegal, let's see, for illegal uh, entry, the normal, well, let me say, normally for illegal reentry, the, the, the charge, or excuse me, would be for illegal reentry would be a class A misdemeanor. What we're talking about here are the enhancement, the enhanced punishment. We're not talking about the initial charge, the class A misdemeanor, we're talking about the enhancement. And so it would be a felony under my bill, it would be a felony of the third degree, which the range of punishment is two to 10 years, um, if the defendant's removal was subsequent to it, a conviction for commission of two or more misdemeanors involving drugs, crimes against the person, or both. So first of all, that's probably, we're dealing with drugs, dealing with issues, dealing with the health and safety code, uh, crimes against a person. Those could be assault, sexual assault, all those things probably uh, under Title Five and Six of the Penal Code, and so, or both. And so we're talking about folks that have other convictions. The second part of that, B, is that the defendant was excluded. In other words, removed from the country because the defendant was excludable under uh, 8 U.S.C. 1182, 1182A3B for whoever's keeping score. Those provisions have to do with terrorist activities. Okay, so these, these are people that have been excluded from the country for, for participating in and acting in, in for terrorist activities. Lastly, the dependent was removed pursuant to the provisions of 8 U.S.C. Chapter 12, Subchapter B, which is again, alien terrorist removal procedures. So, and lastly, the defendant was removed pursuant to uh, smuggling or harboring, which is also defined under the federal statute. So, all those things are very serious and a threat to our, our safety. I don't think it's unfair that those people, in addition to re-entering our country again, having been found guilty of that, that the range of punishment shouldn't be stronger than a misdemeanor. And what the amendment here is asking that it be reduced to a state jail felony. Well, um, I, it's just a policy difference of what we think the punishment ought to be. But quite frankly, I think two to 10 years for folks like that that are trying, that are terrorists and, and so forth, that have been removed for terrorist activities and they've re-entered our country, there need to be consequences for that. So I, I'm in, you know, I'm in opposition to the amendment for those reasons. Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield for time? Yes, I will.
for, for questions. The gentleman yields yeah. for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Spiller. And I, I don't. I, I saw the same and picked up the same USC statute, Section 1182A3B, which can be found on page six between 14 and 16. And I don't know that I would necessarily disagree with you either that maybe a third degree there is appropriate for somebody that has been deported and removed for terrorism, right? But your provision here on 18, it's an or. So I, I want to make sure we're not confusing and adding these as an and. These are separate standalone paragraphs, A, B, C, and D, correct? Yeah, yeah. heaven forbid we have all, somebody commit all four. Right. Uh, yeah, those folks probably need longer than a, th a third degree. But, but yes, each one of those is a separate category. So your, your provision here is four different categories, so I don't want to confuse them. But I was confused equally because I thought the same thing. And I thought, well, Section B is terrorism against the United States. That is obviously something we want to take seriously. But then under subsection D, it's nonviolent offense. I mean, that could be a DWI. To me, those don't equate to needing the same punishment range, do they to you? Under which section are you talking about? Under Section D. So under USC Section 1231A4B, I looked it up. And it's a nonviolent offense because I've, I've looked at your same provisions and thought, what's the commonality in these four paragraphs? Because I was trying to figure out where you guys were going with it. And one is terrorism and one is a nonviolent offense. And the other in A could potentially, to Mr. Or Chairman Moody's point, be two Class C misdemeanors. I mean, okay, those, well, are, those are drastically different potential underlying uh, offenses. In my understanding of 8 U.S.C. 1231A4B has to do with two, two different things. One is the federal equivalent of smuggling, what we have smuggling of persons, they call smuggling, and the other has to do with harboring. Uh, and so uh, those are under the federal statute. And so uh, that, that's my understanding. I don't want to get that wrong, so I'm going to look it up while you and I are talking. Can you, would you be open to clarifying under subsection A, where it says two or more misdemeanors involving drugs, crimes against a person, or both? And as Chairman Moody said, it could be without clarification that you're talking about a class B or a class A, you could dip into class C land. What are okay. your thoughts on that? Okay, well it's, our, our, so now we're back on, up to subsection A of the enhanced punishment? Well, Yes, under right. subsection A, All right. page 6, lines 10 through 13. And the Presumably, first one, those could be class C's, right? Well, they could be, uh, you're, cor you're correct. It, I don't know about class C's because the, uh, under drugs, you've got possession of drug paraphernalia. Is that, a, is that a involving drugs? I don't know that it is. Um, a question there, but I'm, but I'm assuming we're talking about, we're talking about criminal offenses under, as far as involving drugs, which I think would primarily be, although it's not necessarily limited to those items that I would think would be in the health, Texas health and safety code. The other have to do crimes against a so person. So could we clarify that in an amendment to say that we are talking about offenses that can be found in the um, proper provisions of um, penalty groups one through four, whatever it is? So okay. it, it, I, I want to clarify this because I'm, I'm looking up, I want to now jump back to three because I know I'm going to get hit with the gavel and they're going to say we can't extend the time to engage in this important discussion. When we look at 8 U.S.C. section 1231A, detention, release, and removal of aliens ordered removed, and then I go down to four, which is aliens in prison arrested or on parole, supervision, release, and probation, and B, exception for removal for nonviolent offenders prior to completion. Am I just reading it wrong? And that's why I wanted to make sure. I, I, don't, read, I don't read the fourth paragraph as dealing with human trafficking or smuggling. And again, if I'm reading the statute wrong, let me see. I might be reading it wrong, Mr. Spiller. I apologize. Wow. Hold on.
I mean, now when I look at 4B, again, I, I'm not seeing under this provision where it's dealing with smuggling, and I apologize, but if there's a way to clarify whether or not this provision 1231A4B is actually getting to what we think. Yeah, you know, I don't, I would say I believe under that section D, we're dealing with the federal offenses of smuggling and harboring. That's my understanding of, of 1231A4B. And I, I can't put my finger on it right now, but that's my okay. understanding. If we, if we can look and clarify, because when I look at, and again, I'm, I'm going to Cornell Law School, law.cornell.edu on where they've got the provisions of these federal statutes, and that's just one of the locations. So maybe there's something right. not right about uh, the internet, but I'm, I fear that this right. pr particular provision is not g geared towards smuggling. Well, um, at, the, at the end of the day, it's, it, we're, still, we're still here. I, I understand you think it could be or should be reduced, that the, the, all these enhancements should be reduced to a state jail felony, which would be punishable by, you know, under a state jail provision under six months to two years. Day for uh, day. Uh, as opposed to You know this. Third degree. Folks don't like going to state jail. What's that? I said, you know this as a criminal defense attorney. Folks don't like going to state jail because it's day for day. Well, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I, I, I get it. But like I say, I think it's generally... A philosophical difference where I think that we need to have a higher punishment enhancement for some of these repeat offenders if they come in and we're having to if we're having to prosecute someone for re-entry after they've already gentlemen's time has expired <laughs> chair recognizes Ms. Johnson of Harris to close on her amendment Mr. Speaker and members, again, uh, you've, you've heard the dialogue with regard to there are four subcategories under this provision that call for a third degree felony. And a third degree felony is two to 10 years in prison. There is everything from the potential, because it just says misdemeanor and offense against person, there's a way for us to clarify this and say we mean class B or class A on the misdemeanors as a prior. As I mentioned, there's a provision that talks about terrorism. Hey, I might get that where we talk about the issue of terrorism. Um, but again, we've got some other provisions where maybe two to 10 is not an appropriate punishment range. And so a state jail felony offense accomplishes the goal of what I think he is trying to do here, which is to increase from a misdemeanor to a felony, and it is the intermediary step. It also has the benefit to us as a state of Texas that if this is somebody that you are saying, I no longer want them here and they need to go back to their home country, then what is the perverse incentive for then incarcerating somebody for up to 10 years in a state prison. It makes no sense. If the intent is to say, go back, then why would you have these punishment ranges of third degrees or second degrees that would put us in a position of longer incarceration and more time and more expense? And so again, when we talk about the challenge of, are we really talking about effective policy with regard to the border and perpetrators? Are we really giving tools in the toolbox for law enforcement to use? Or are we simply putting things out there that maybe sound like we're doing something really good, but maybe in essence creates a policy that contradicts the very things we're telling our voters? So I would ask that you guys please vote yes on the amendment to change this to a state jail felony offense. Question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Uh -oh, nice not there. Show Mr. Spiller voting nay. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There being 60 ayes and 82 nays, the amendment fails.
Following amendment, clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Ann Johnson of Harris. Chair recognizes Representative Johnson of Harris. Mr. Speaker and members, we are now making our way to the next portion of the bill, which sets, again, a punishment range. And this time, you're on the hook for 20 years. So it's the same question. Is this a population of people that you collectively are saying, leave the country and go back to your place of origin because you have gotten here illegally? And do you want to house them for 20 years on taxpayer dollars. And so again, I would say a state jail felony accomplishes the goal of sending a message for a state jail punishment, which is going to be eligible for all the proper federal deportations aside from this provision. And it puts the taxpayers on the hook for six months to two years, but it doesn't put us on the hook for two years to 20. So again, you're saying you don't want these people here. So if you don't want them here, why do you want to pay to house them for 20 years? That's the amendment. Mr. Mr. Moody, for what purpose? Will the gentlelady yield for questions? Will the yes. gentlelady, gentlelady, gentlelady will yield? I will. Thank you, Ms. Johnson of Harris. Um, to be clear, we're now moved into, as compared so, with your prior amendment, we're moving into another set of aggravating factors that lift what would have been a class A misdemeanor to a second degree felony. Is that correct? Yes, and if I may, if you'll look at page six, line 22, mm -hmm. it's a second degree if you were removed subsequent to a conviction for the commission of a felony. So a felony could be possession of drugs. A felony could be a DWI. Again, it's not a violent felony. It's not, as we talked about earlier, the people we would presumably want to prosecute with witnesses under the U visa. It's any technical felony. And so, so again, so we may house somebody longer on this offense than we could have housed them, because you could remove on a, a state jail felony. So, well, and I think we, we've encountered this certainly recently, but um, a vape pen, possession of a vape pen, that's a felony, rights. right? Yep. Okay. Uh, trace amounts. I know there's a number of trace amount cases out in Harris County in your area. Those would be felonies. You could, you, nonviolent offenses. Because we're not actually limiting this to certain types of felonies. It's just anything. Yeah, anything. So if you enhanced from a class A to a state jail felony, because something's within a, a, a zone or a parking lot. If somebody has drugs in a parking lot, a low-level misdemeanor amount in a parking lot of a school, it now bumps it up to a state jail felony. Effectively, that would comply with this provision. And so again, you may have somebody that was deported for committing the grade level, I'm telling you, six months to two years, but if they come back, you're now gonna house them for 20 years. Yeah, and I guess I, I'm going to come at this in two different directions. I'm not trying to say that the conduct is something that we should be, you know, uh, you know, dismissive of, because this also gathers up any number of other felonies. My guess is if you were convicted of a serious felony, you're probably going to still be incarcerated. You would hope, right? I mean, if, I, if you've committed a murder, you hope that they were sentenced to 40 years. Well, and so and that's what I want to get. That's what I want to get to because. The idea that dangerous felons are pouring over the border and doing all this, and we hear this rhetoric all the time. If you're convicted of these types of felonies, more likely than not, you're, you're serving a sentence now. And if you are, my guess is if you were here undocumented, you'd probably have a federal detainer on you subsequent to that that sentence being served out, isn't that right? Yes. You're going to get deported as soon as you serve your sentence. And that's something that we as prosecutors take into consideration, mm -hmm. which is if you're going to leave, right, and the effect of the conviction is a deportation, then why do I want to house you here any longer? Well, and so those are decisions that it seems like we, we make today. I mean, you'd agree with me. Those are considerations as you look at someone's status and the crime that's sitting in front of you as a prosecutor 
knowing that that individual's next next trip is deportation, right? Correct. And so what you're saying is really who you're going to grab with these are probably low-level felons because the other ones are going to be either still incarcerated or already deported. And we're going to bump that up and house someone for up to 20 years instead of with your, pro your proposal, which would still be a felony conviction, which would still call for incarceration, which would still have deportable, it would still have deportable, you know, the ramific de deportation ramifications for that individual. But you, but the cost to our taxpayers would be two years max. But all the Correct. all the other ancillary things that come with the felony conviction are still going to come along with that offender under your amendment. Yes, you're, you're still going to take the course of conduct of the individual. And if the individual is committing other crimes, then obviously this is going to be something that gets aggravated in punishment of what other, other crimes that they're doing. This amendment effectively just focuses on the only violation that the person is committing is their existence, presence. They're not committing another crime except for being here. And for that, how much do you want to roll the federal tax burden onto the state of Texas into our taxpayers? Because just as Mr. Spiller keeps saying, this is a federal crime. You're not, you're not creating a new crime that doesn't already exist that the federal government can prosecute, can pay for, and can detain for. You're, you're creating a whole other thing where you're saying, uh, you're, you're creating an additional tax burden on Texans, and not only are you incurring an original tax burden on us, but you want to have it play out for 20 years. Now, well, I mean, if I'm being devil's advocate, what would you say to somebody that says, well, you're, you're just letting people off easy here. These are people that have been convicted of a felony before. Why wouldn't we want to ratchet up the penalty on them? you need to figure out what the felony is. And we don't do that in here. And so, just as we mentioned, you can be a 17-year-old kid in a parking lot outside of a school with what would normally be misdemeanor possession or somebody else's, uh, you know, I can't remember which ones we moved, but we did move Adderall or whatever else. That it's a prescription that some kid gets from their doctor and they have it in their pocket and then they're felony, right? They're a felon. Yep. And so, again, that's, this is the kind of stuff that your kids could commit, yeah. right? So the, so the way I see it, as I said before, you've got two, two issues here. We're not breaking out the type of felony at all. So we're treating all felonies the same, which is probably not wise policy. That's probably too big, probably too broad a brush to paint with in this circumstance. You would agree with me. The other is when we do that, we compound the problem by then bearing the burden of incarceration as Texas taxpayers. Correct. What it, would you would you agree that I mean, maybe 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 you could talk to Mr. Spiller about this? Uh, maybe an amendment to your amendment that would parse out the types of felonies because you know maybe maybe we get to a point where we say, look, I. Even though we don't want these people incarcerated on the Texas dime, the offense that they were previously convicted of is of such a nature that we also don't want to just send them off into deportation knowing that they could find their way back into the state and do more harm. You'd agree with me. Maybe, maybe there is some sort of breakdown of felonies that, that could warrant a higher penalty, but we don't do that here in this bill. Correct, and this is something that we talked about last week on the toolbox, the layers of the onion, the discretion as prosecutors. And when you simply say misdemeanor or felony, and I agree, felony sounds bad, but some of those fact patterns are not something that you would say, and I think a typical thing that you and I would look at is are they a violent offense? Are they 3G offense? Yeah, are I, they I, crimes of moral turpitude? I, I, think, I, think the, I think the conversation that you and I are having would be very different 
if there was a more thoughtful approach to how we've ratcheted up this penalty. Because as it stands now, you've got everything. Gentlemen, ladies, time has expired. Hold on, just a second. Chair recognizes Chairman Metcalf for a very important announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, dinner is for purchase in the members' lounge at a southern home cooked meatloaf, gravy, mashed potatoes, green beans, chocolate cake for purchase in the members' lounge. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Spiller in opposition to the amendment. Mr. Speaker. Ms. Niave Criado, for what purpose? Does the gentleman yield? Does the gentleman yield? Let me give a my statement give, for its brief opposition, then I will. Give the gentleman just one moment. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let me just say this amendment was similar to the last amendment in that it deals with reentry and the enhanced punishments. This one's the greatest enhanced punishment, and it provides, and what we're talking about here is if you have reentered, if you're charged with reentering our country, our state, uh, our state under, under the reentry provision, and you have already been removed from our state, from our country, to another country. And this is based on the fact that you were removed because of the conviction of a felony. So this is, this, these individuals are people that have already gotten here illegally, committed a felony, removed, and now they're back again. And so it's really just a philosophical difference uh, of whether you think that the penalty, the range of punishment for that could be uh, as little as six months in a state jail facility or whether you think it ought to be a secondary felony, which is two to 20 years. I, perf I believe it ought to be the latter. I, thought there ought I think there ought to be consequences for those actions. And I think if, the if you've been committed a felony and ordered out of our country and yet you come back in, then there need to be consequences for that. So that's my opposition when I would yield to questions. Thank you, Representative. Mr. Speaker, does the gentleman yield now? Gentleman yes. yields. Thank you. Um, with respect to this illegal reentry section that you're discussing, earlier you had mentioned that this mirrors the federal um, crime or the federal 8 U.S.C. 1326. Is that correct? Yes. The, okay. the pertinent parts of it, yes. And, and the, the, I'm sorry, what was that? The pertinent Yes, the part? pertinent parts of the bill as far as primarily dealing with the elements of the offense of illegal reentry track 8 U.S.C. Uh, 1326. Okay, and um, are you aware that in Section 8 U.S.C. 1326, it actually has an exception in the federal statute that is not in your version of the statute? It may. And, well, and I have the language here because I wanted to double check, and it, in fact, the exception says that unless the Attorney General has expressly consented to such aliens reapplying for admission, and it has language in there. So the federal government set up this entire process to consider requests from people to be let back in, and the federal government then allows people to reapply to enter, so this charge doesn't apply to them. But in your bill, it, it's not the same as the federal analog because under federal law, somebody can, can still get re-entry, but yours is not allowing that so that contravenes federal law so, so so are you saying that that's why that this needs to be a state jail felony instead of a second degree felony what, what i'm saying is that with respect to the illegal entry section you you've stated and discussed language regarding um this mirroring federal law and as we're talking about the constitutionality of the bill this doesn't mirror the federal law because yours doesn't have the exception. So are you, you're aware that it didn't have the, the exception okay, in the well, federal law, correct? It's, it's, it's written somewhat differently as far as the enhanced punishment. But I will say when I look here at 8 U.S.C. 1326, uh, under B-2, the, the removal was substantive to a conviction for commission of an aggravated felony, and you could be in prison for not more than 20 years. So again, the range of punishment, here we're talking about a felony, a prior conviction for a felony, and this could be any felony. It could be something more serious than an aggravated felony. It's just any felony, and the range of punishment under the federal statute is up to 20 years. The proposed punishment for that same enhancement under my bill is a secondary felony, which is two to 20 years. That seems pretty close. 
So, so the, the, the punishment mirrors it, other parts of the, your statute mirrors it, but it doesn't have the exception that the federal government has, correct? I, I just want to make sure that you're aware that your statute, Senate Bill 4, yeah. are you aware that yours does not have the exception that is in the federal statute that you said it mirrors? Okay. And the exception, the, the section that you're, not that that has, in my view, not that that has anything to do with the amendment, but the exception you're referring to is what, what is the number? It's a USC section 1326 subsection A subsection two. So you know how you have the language regarding if they were denied admission, right. excluded, deported, and then it has or departed or it even at enters right. or attempts to enter. So it's the yeah. first part of the statute as well, right. at any time in the United States, if they're found at any time in the United States. The federal statute has exception that says, unless prior to the re-embarkation at a place outside the United States or his application for admission from foreign contiguous territory, the attorney general has expressly consented to such aliens reapplying for admission, or it has subsection B, with respect to an alien previously denied admission and removed, unless such alien shall establish that he was not required to obtain such advanced consent well, under this chapter or any okay. prior act. I see where you're reading there, but the operative provisions of uh, illegal reentry in Senate Bill 4 are tracked from a one, not two. And well, so it's tracked from A one, but what we're talking about with this amendment is what the punishment should be for enhanced uh, uh, an, an enhancement for prior conviction. And right. so this is a prior conviction of a felony, and that I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't see that that has anything to do with that. We're talking about on the amendment as far as whether we ought to reduce the punishment to as little as six months in jail, my, my belief, my personal preference is not no, but heck no. Well, well it does have to do because there's, the, uh, it goes to the exception being in federal law that's not in yours. So I just wanted to find out if you were aware yeah, that I'm, that exception is not in H Senate Bill 4, but it is in federal statute. Yeah, I'm, I've read it. I've read eight, uh, USC 1326 in its entirety, and, the, uh, and I see the language that you're talking okay, about. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Chair recognizes Johnson of Harris to close on her amendment. Mr. Speaker and members, I mentioned this last week and I sincerely believe that we have legitimate discussions and things that we need to talk about on the border. I have walked the walk of people who have gotten here legally or illegally and committed crimes. I am probably the only person in this room who has actually prosecuted, some of you may have arrested them, but have actually prosecuted individuals who have violated these laws and put them in prison. I have been in your courthouses and I have seen how this plays out and poo rolls downhill. I have spent countless times in the courtroom dealing with unfunded mandates and the idea that we pass things that are expedient, but somebody has to implement these on the back end and that is going to fall on your counties, your local entities, your local officers, your local police departments, and then the taxpayers of Texas are gonna pay the bill. So if our goal is to say that we don't want these individuals in the United States because they didn't do it right and we are sending them back home, then how much of a contradiction is it to set a punishment range of two to 20? Because if you think that's a deterrent, it's not. The punishment range is not a deterrent. The punishment range oftentimes for criminal offenders is how long can I keep them removed from other people in society so that they don't commit or cause harm? And in this circumstance, the population that you're catching up, it says misdemeanor, it says felony. It doesn't distinguish between violent offense, nonviolent offense, and it doesn't allow you to make the determination, is this somebody 
that I'm mad at or is this somebody that I'm afraid of? And that is an issue that we deal with all the time of trying to reach this balance of what is my goal and what is my fiduciary duty to taxpayers with regard to the criminal justice system? Where should I house people? Where should I put them in beds? And if it's somebody that's going to hurt you, your daughters, your granddaughters, or somebody else, that's where I should reserve our punishment for those folks. But if it's somebody that's just making me mad because they can't get their stuff together, they've got an addiction issue or something else and I'm just frustrated, then we ought to be smarter about how we address that issue. And this is one of those. You are literally taking a population that may be a nonviolent offender. We've created almost an impossible standard of how we can bounce between misdemeanor and felony without looking at the distinctions. And then you want to hand them a punishment of 20 years in state prison. If they've committed another crime, I promise you they're going to get popped for that crime. If they've committed a crime of which the federal government can go get them, then let them go get them. But if the only crime that they are committing is we are mad at them that they have found a way across the border, but they haven't done anything else, then why do you want to assess such a high burden on taxpayers? Six months to two years in state jail is a whole heck of a lot of an expense and it's gonna have the same deterrent that the other range will have. And so I would ask that you vote for this amendment. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? Being 61 A's, 61 ayes, 81 nays, the amendment fails to adopt. Following amendment, clerk will ring the amendment. Amendment by Ann Johnson of Harris. Chair recognizes Johnson of Harris. All right, everybody, we're on to the third punishment range. Do you want to house people for 20 years or do you want to put it as state jail felony? I would ask that you vote for the amendment. Make it quick. Chair recognizes Representative Spiller in, in opposition to the amendment. Chair recognizes Representative Spiller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, um, sound like a broken record, but I, I, I respectfully um, uh, oppose the amendment under the same grounds that we did before. I understand what we're trying to do here, but I just think that the, uh, that the punishment for this needs to be where it is in the bill. And so it's just a policy uh, decision. And so I respectfully oppose it. Chair recognizes Representative Johnson of Harris to close on our amendment. Tell Texas taxpayers whether or not you want them paying for this in addition to the federal taxes that we're sending to the federal government, or do you want to let the feds take on an obligation that they are already legally obligated to it? You can put the, the cost on Texas taxpayers or not. That's the vote. I'm with Texas taxpayers. I don't want to spend more of your money. So join me. Vote yes on this amendment. The question occurs on the adoption of amendment. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There have been 62 ayes and 81 nays. The amendment fails. Is Ms. Perez on the floor of the House?
Following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Perez. Chair recognizes Representative Perez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this amendment inserts language to Section 51.04, which allows a person to surrender to the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol or other federal officials located at a point of entry instead of prosecution. I move adoption. The chair recognizes Representative Spiller in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, I respectfully oppose the amendment. Um, I, I think that we hurt the effectiveness of the bill on the uh, charge of refusal to comply with an order uh, to return to a foreign nation by adopting this amendment. Uh, and so I think it weakens the bill, weakens the, the purpose of what we're trying to do here to deter uh, uh, illegal uh, immigration, the illegal crossings. So I respectfully uh, oppose it. Chair recognizes Ms. Perez to close on our amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, so basically this amendment allows a person to claim asylum without being charged a second degree felony. So I hope you vote with me. I move adoption. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. That's a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Show Mr. Spiller voting no. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? Being 60 ayes and 82 nays, the amendment fails. Following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Hernandez. Chair recognizes Representative Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. My amendment would provide an affirmative defense to prosecution if an individual failed to comply with the removal order because the foreign country they were ordered to return to denied them entry. SB 4 provides that a magistrate or judge may, in lieu of continuing prosecution, dismiss the charge and order the person to return to the foreign country from which they entered. Failing to comply with the removal order is a separate offense that is a second-degree felony, punishable by two to 20 years in prison. This removal provision is unworkable. The majority of migrants entering the United States at the Texas-Mexico border are not Mexican citizens. They do not have the right to return to Mexico and do not have to be granted admission back into the country from which they entered. Allowing people to be subject to two to 20 years in prison for failure to follow an order that was impossible to comply with is a grave miscarriage of justice. As before, would potentially leave thousands of people in an impossible situation. They could not return to Texas without facing harsh criminal penalties, but they could also not return to Mexico legally they would essentially be left in the middle of the bridge, floating in legal limbo, with no option to enter either country. 
Mr. Speaker, I move adoption. Chair recognizes Rep Representative Spiller in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I'm, uh, I, I appreciate what's trying to be done here, but I think uh, the, the bill provides for this because it's, on, it's creating potentially under this amendment an affirmative defense to prosecution because someone attempted to comply but were not able to. The, the elements of refusal to comply with an order to return require an actual refusal to comply. So by definition, I'm not sure how you have a, uh, you know, how if they attempted to do it, but through some unknown circumstances or outside circumstances, we're not able to do that, i.e. the receiving country did not cooperate. I'm not really sure how we therefore, the, the idea would be that we therefore if, if that person did everything they could, that we therefore uh, prosecute them because of refusal when in fact they did not refuse. So I think by definition, it's taken care of in the bill. I do appreciate the thought, and I Mr. appreciate Speaker? what, what uh, Ms. Weiner, for what purpose? trying to do. Will the gentleman yield for questions? Will the gentleman yield for questions? The gentleman yields. Representative Spiller, is refuse a term that is defined in Texas statute? That I don't know. It probably is in some in some statute somewhere, uh, but I, I don't. As a refusal in the penal code, I'm not I'm not certain on that. Yeah. So, given that there isn't a clear definition for what refusal to comply means, could you I see would, there being some confusion I where someone be, would, could get prosecuted? It, it, it would. It, my understanding is, as far as the code construction uh, would be. The com if it's not otherwise defined, and I, and I don't know that it's otherwise defined, it's at least not in the penal code, but that you would, under the uh, code of construction, that you would use the common meaning. And by definition, if I refuse something, I'm making a conscious decision to not comply with, with something. So here, by definition, I, you know, I see what we're trying to address here, but I don't think that it's necessary. Do you think that it's reasonable for us to be absolutely sure both about what that definition is or to offer some clarity if we're talking about locking people up for up to 20 years? Well, it seems pretty clear to me. Uh, so, I, I mean, in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a simple thinker, but in my mind, I don't think it's necessary. I think, uh, I think it's very clear here so, that... I, I'm sorry. Ahead. So, to be clear, you don't think this is necessary, and you don't think this is necessary because you don't think the statute as it's written would allow somebody to be prosecuted if they were told to return to Mexico and Mexico wouldn't take them? I think that, as with any case, a prosecutor would have, to, would have to prove each and every element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm, I'm trying to figure yeah. how a prosecutor could prove that someone refused to comply when, in fact, they agreed to comply, attempted to comply, did everything asked of them, and yet the receiving country was the party that didn't cooperate. I don't, I don't really see how you prosecute someone for that. I, I'm sorry, Representative Spiller, because I, I think we're looking for clarity here. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I can't hear myself back here. Members, please take your conversations outside the rail. So, Representative Spiller, I think the reason Representative Hernandez brought this amendment was for clarity. And I asked you a clarifying question, and quite frankly, I got so many words, I'm still not sure what the answer is. Okay. So, do you believe this is unnecessary because you think the statute, as written, does not allow the prosecution of someone who, try, who was ordered to leave the country and was unable to leave because the, Mexico would not receive them? I, I think every, as with every case, is determined on a fact by, I mean, by case by case basis, the facts are determined. Well, I, but I think we just stipulated it's a fact gave, pattern. Under the scenario that you gave, if someone did everything that they were supposed to and said, I agree, say on the front end, uh, well, this is on the back end, on refusal to comply, but say, let's say on illegal entry, they come in and th then they say, they take them to a magistrate and they say, look, we agree to go back, take us back. So we, you know, direct DPS or whatever law enforcement authority, make them, take them to a port of entry. The people attempt to go, do go, and then for some reason or other, something beyond their control uh, is done and they're unable to comply. But under your scenario, if they have done everything that they agreed to do when they agreed to go back and they're prohibited from going back, then do I see that as a, that they've somehow committed a second degree felony? No, I don't. 
Okay, so your intent is that this statute should not be used to prosecute someone who, in good faith, attempts to return to the country they're ordered to return to, if they but is not with, allowed to by the receiving country. If they've stuck with their agreement and they've, and they've done everything, I, I don't want to say something here improper, but if they've abided by their agreement to go back and they did everything under their power and what they were asked to do and what they agreed to do, and they attempted to comply with that order to return and were prohibited from doing so, uh, then they have not, under my view, they have not refused anything. They've done what they agreed to do. So I, I really appreciate that, Representative Spiller, and I, I appreciate that interpretation of the statute. I think my next ask here is we have 254 district attorneys in the state of Texas who are going to be interpreting this. Can we put that clarity into the bill so that they know that as well? Right, and I, I appreciate the effort, and I do appreciate what the, the amendment uh, uh, attempts to do here, but as I've stated, I think it's it's clear, it's very clear to me, and and uh, and I think the bill's fine the way it's written in that respect in, in regard to that issue. I, I mean, with all due respect, you know, Representative Hernandez is an attorney. Um, there's a lot of members on this floor who don't see that as very clear. Right. And, so, and, I'm, and I know we discussed yeah. this last special session on the last day of Groundhog Day. Right. right. Um, in my experience, have been you have two or more attorneys in a room, you probably have differing opinions. So I, I get that, I respect that, but I think the bill's, I think it's fine the way it is. So what would the harm be of adding this language to the bill? I don't know that it would be harmful. I, I just don't think it's necessary, other than the harm that we're further delaying the crisis that we have on our southern border. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, my, my goal is to get this bill passed and get it passed cleanly and get it on the governor's desk because every day, based on the month of September alone, every day that we delay or this process is delayed is approximately 9,000 people that enter our state illegally. Some are terrorists, we know that. We, uh, we 169 from last year, and that's more than the six previous years combined. We, uh, my view and my task is to get this bill out of here and on the governor's desk as soon as possible. Because if I, if I waste my time and, and know that it's gonna be a delay, I'm gonna have trouble sleeping at night, and I don't want that. Representative Spiller, I understand your sense of urgency, but again, we are talking about locking people up for 20 years. Not days, years. Right. Don't you think we owe it to them to get this right and to make I, sure no one is convicted of something they don't deserve to be convicted of? I, I, I would never want anyone convicted for something that they shouldn't be convicted of. But again, I think the bill addresses that. I think it's very clear. I don't think that's going to happen. And um, I think it's fine the way it is. We know we're going to be here until at least the end of the week. I think the Senate has plenty of time to concur on this amendment. Right. And like I say, every day that goes by, by on average, is approximately 9,000 people that enter our state illegally. And I, my job is to get this bill to the governor. All right. Thank you, Representative you Spiller. Chair recognizes Representative Hernandez to close on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, by Mr. Spiller's calculation, if 9,000 people are entering the state illegally each day, they are subject to this bill. They are subject, whether if they're re-entering, to be convicted to two to 20 years in prison. It is our taxpayers that are gonna be footing that bill. This is simply saying that if they have been ordered to be removed, and Mexico is not accepting them. We're asking them to do the impossible. Let's not convict them to 20 years in prison. I move adoption. Question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There being 59 ayes and 82 nays, the amendment fails. Is Mr. Wu on the floor of the House? Mr. Wu. Amendment does 
those things. Following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Goodwin. Chair recognizes Representative Goodwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, our institutions of higher education are built on trust, a trust that exists between students and their teachers, coaches, peers, and law enforcement. This trust is a foundation. It's paramount for the education, healthy civic engagement, and growth of our students. We in this body encourage individuals, documented or otherwise, to enroll in workforce programs at community colleges for reskilling or upskilling. Our youth are urged to pursue college education and STEM degrees. We consistently advocate for our friends and family to obtain credentials and pursue education beyond high school. Campuses are not just physical spaces, they are environments where young minds learn, grow, and come into their own. They are spaces where workers reimagine their careers and strive for a better future. We call upon Texans to enroll and trust that higher education will pay off. Unfortunately, Senate Bill 4 threatens to undercut the very trust necessary for students to thrive and realize the promise of education. This amendment aims to safeguard the trust between students and their campuses. Specifically, my amendment proposes the inclusion of institutions of higher education on the list of spaces exempt from the implementation of SB4. By doing so, this amendment sends a clear signal to our students. The trust they place in their colleges should be preserved regardless of their immigration status. Specifically, my amendment would add institutions of higher education to the list of spaces where SB4 would not be implemented. In doing so, my amendment signals to our students that the trust they have in their colleges should be maintained no matter their status. I move adoption. Chair recognizes Representative Spiller in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, I oppose this amendment. Um, we, I've tried to be fair and, and put in some safeguards for people, for situations. We've protected children as far as uh, uh, schools, uh, and, and we've protected people as far as health care, medical care, uh, victims of, uh, of rape and so forth. But when we open it up and say we've created uh, on college campuses a, an ability to come and create a sanctuary, I cannot agree to that. Mr. Speaker? Ms. Weiner, for what purpose? Will the gentleman yield for some questions? Will the gentleman questions? yield sure. for questions? The gentleman yields. Are you aware that about 26% of American children have at least one immigrant parent? I don't have any reason to dispute that. Uh, are you concerned that under this legislation, parents might be afraid to drop their kids off at their college dorm for fear of being arrested and removed from the country? I, I would. I don't think that that should be a valid concern. I think if there was not so much misinformation about of Senate Bill 4, then, uh, then you know, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But I think there is a lot of mis intentional misrepresentation, misinformation about the effect of this bill, where it's characterized of we're going to round everybody up and ship them back to some other country. That's not this bill. And so uh, there, I'm not saying that some people don't have a fear or intrepidation about the bill, but what I'm saying is it is not what some people have portrayed it to be. So no, I don't, I'm not that concerned. I don't think that's going to, I mean, that shouldn't happen. And I don't, I don't see why we need to create a, a exception where there shouldn't have to be one. With all due respect, Representative Spiller, your bill under the illegal reentry statute or portion of the bill says an alien who is at any time found in the country. That's not crossing, that is present after previously having been denied admission to the United States or removed or deported. Well, you, So there you is left, that situation where somebody right. could be rounded up at well, any place in the country. Well, you left out some critical elements of that. Yes, if they're in the country, but that they have been removed from the country previously, have been or deported. Or denied admission, originally. that's and, an or. And so what I'm saying is, when you, when you take that portion out of context, 
yes, that doesn't sound good, but that's not the statute. But that's, that's not the, the bill. Statute. That is in the bill, Representative Spiller. Oh, I, you have you to look at all the information, but right. it's an or. Right. Well, twofold. It's, it's Number one, either. that's not the full statute. So that's a misrepresentation if that's the representation that if you're here at any time illegally in our state that you're subject to criminal prosecution. That is not true. Admission. Yes, and you secondly, can be prosecuted for a class A misdemeanor. And secondly, that is that is existing federal law right now and has been for decades. This is, I mean, you know, have we had issues and concerns about this before? But uh, federal why, INS why doesn't sudden, usually we hang out at the this? Texas state dorms. Whereas every university in the state of Texas that I'm aware of has law enforcement present on campus. And okay. you're giving those law enforcement the ability to enforce this statute right now. Currently, they have no power to enforce that immigration statute. And so what I'm asking you is, do you think that our college campuses should be somewhere that our immigrant parents of Texas college students should be afraid to go? Because your bill will make them afraid to go there. No one should be afraid to go to college. No one should be afraid to be in public. We're addressing illegal crossing into our state. I've already said 95% of this is going to be enforced on the border within 50 miles of the border. Could it's be a statewide deal. Mom. I know that. But what I'm saying is we are trying to combat a problem of illegal immigration. We are not trying to round up people at colleges and universities and put them in jails or the penitentiary. That is not the so purpose Representative of Senate Spiller, Bill So, Representative Spiller, if that's not what we're trying to do, why not, You're just right. like we did with K-12 schools, exclude our colleges and universities? Well, because by definition, they ha those folks haven't, presumably, have not committed a criminal offense. Why are we creating, a, addressing a problem that does not exist? Representative Spiller, I know you keep saying your bill only enforces or only criminalizes actually crossing, but that's just not true. If we all look at the top of page six, we can all read the lines about how it is a criminal offense to be in the state of Texas if you have right. previously been denied admission, removed, or deported. And that describes a non-zero number of people in Texas, including people who now, after having been denied entry years ago, have been here decades. Okay, Those well, people I've... have raised families. I have seen families separated in my district okay. over well, I've, minor I've tried offenses. To be, I've tried to be very straightforward about what this bill does and how it applies. And by being forthright and telling you that I think that the application of this bill will be with the vast majority will be in 50 miles of the border. That's not a misstatement. That's the truth. And I'm not trying to mislead anybody, but I am saying uh, this, you know, uh, it's, it's a statewide law, but we're, you're trying to say that there's a problem at college campuses for fear that people can't go to college, and that's just not true under this bill. I, Representative Spiller, I would love to invite you to some of the college campuses around the, tech, around the state where we have the children of immigrants as well as dreamers organizing and worried about this issue. Right. And so I'm, I'm asking you to hear them. Right. You know, if, if your intention is that this bill not come on to college campuses, let's put that in the bill. I mean, I really keep appreciating what you say about intentions, but yeah. I don't know how to square that with the actual language of the legislation. Right. You know, I'd be happy to, to work with you uh, upon if, if this passes and gets out of this house and gets to the governor's desk and he signs it, I'll be happy to put out any kind of information sheet as, a, as the bill author to every college and university in our state. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to put out just a fact sheet about this bill. I'm happy to cooperate in every way that I can. And so I'm, I'm committing to you. I will work to do that. I just don't think that this amendment needs to be in this bill. So, Representative Spiller, if this amendment isn't quite it, could we amend it to say that university police departments don't enforce this? Um, you know, um, I don't think it's necessary. I've, I've kind of addressed that, uh, you know, but I'm willing to work with you and I'm willing to address concerns upon the passage of Senate Bill 4. I'm happy to address any concerns with you and get word out any way that you want me to do. I'm just not, a, I'm not good with this amendment. I mean, Representative Spiller, we usually address concerns by amending the bill, and you've pretty much told us that you're not going to take any amendments. Well, I'm telling so, you, you're not going to take this one. 
<laughs> well, the last one you told me you wouldn't take it for timeliness issues. Well, I'm not, I haven't taken too many today that I know of, so I, I respect that. And, and there have been some very thoughtful approaches and good approaches, and I, I don't fault members for, for doing their best. And, I, and I, you know me, and I'm willing to typically work with people. I worked with people the last time. I've worked this process when it's in the committee, in between time, and I'm willing to do that. My position now is I want to get this thing passed. All right. Thank you, Representative Speller. You bet. Chair recognizes Representative Goodwin to close on the amendment. Members, if you agree that our college campuses and community colleges should be a safe place for our students to go and learn and not be concerned about being picked up, not be concerned about law enforcement and what they might be doing there other than providing for safety, then vote with me on this amendment. I move passage. Move the question adoption. occurs in the adoption of the amendment. This record vote, the clerk ring the bell. Show Ms. Goodwin voting aye. Mr. Spiller voting nay, Mr. Cook voting nay, Mr. Holland voting nay. Mr. Niavadi Criado voting aye. Mr. Jatan voting nay. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There being 61 ayes and 83 nays, the amendment fails to adopt. The following amendment, the clerk read the amendment. Amendment by Wu. The chair recognizes Mr. Wu to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, this amendment would simply prohibit state-sanctioned immigration sweeps at places of business to protect our workforce at their workplace or at off-site work locations. People migrate to the United States for job opportunities, uh, and Texas business employer owners employ them, oftentimes exploiting them for minimum pay, and in some cases forcing them to work in unsafe working conditions. The practice of workplace raids was meant to target employers who drive the demand for illegal immigration through the offer of cheap wages and in bad conditions. Jobs that Americans will not take, but many fleeing violence, starvation, murder, torture, rape, are often have no choice but to take. However, in many practice, however, in practice, workplace rates have served primar primarily to terrorize workers, their communities, with minimal consequences for employers. As the author has repeatedly stated, the purpose of this legislation is not to, enjoy, to address employers and employees of businesses who employ undocumented immigrants. As the bill author has said repeatedly many a times, that he does not believe that this law that he's about to pass would affect people who have been in the country for more than two years, which would be more a lot of the people who are working in places now. Thus, the allowance of workplace raids serves no purpose. This is especially true considering that the author has repeatedly stated over the last two months that this bill is meant to target illegal entry and not documented, undocumented presence by itself. Considering the minuscule likelihood that a person that works has just walked across, that is already at a workplace, has, already, has just walked across the border straight to their employer's place of business, the practice of workplace raids would serve only to target those who are presently in this country without papers and has nothing to do with illegal entry. This amendment at the very least would protect workers who come here to contribute to our economy to support their families from being arrested on the job as they are providing for the Texas economy, as well as ensure this legislation is in practice keeping with its intent. Members, I move the adoption of this amendment. The chair recognizes Mr. Spiller in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, I understand what we're trying to do here with this amendment, but I, and I've been very diligent. In fact, I even expanded some of the places where we couldn't do this from the last time that we met, and I've tried to be very uh, considerate of what we can do and what we do to protect life and uh, keep people safe. Uh, this, this exception is beyond what I'm comfortable with, and I respectfully oppose it. The chair recognizes Mr. Wu to close the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the record, 
Again, the author of this legislation repeatedly, both now and in the previous time we were on the floor in the last legislative session, has said that it is not the intent for this legislation to address this type of activity. That their only intent is to address, address illegal crossings. We could have addressed that in many ways by limiting where this bill could take place, where it could be in effect, what counties can be used as, as prosecution. We didn't do that. We spread this legislation across the entire state. And therefore, by spreading this legislation across the entire state, we've rounded up schools, we've rounded up colleges, we've rounded up women's shelters, we've rounded up all these different things. And what we are attempting to do here with this amendment is piece by piece try to match the intent that the author has stated repeatedly with the actual text of the legislation. This amendment does not destroy this legislation. This amendment puts this legislation exactly in line with what the bill author has stated is his intent. If you are voting no on this legislation, you are saying that what he's saying as his intent is not actually correct. The question occurs in the adoption of the amendment. This record of vote. The clerk ring the bell. Show Mr. Wu voting aye, Mr. Spill voting nay. Ms. Theory voting aye, Mr. Cook voting nay. Have all members voted? There being 60 ayes and 83 nays, the amendment fails to adopt. Members under House rules and the policies and procedures manual of the 88th legislature. Members may not take photos or make video recordings of House proceedings unless approved in advance by the chair of House administration. If a member takes a photo or makes a video recording during floor sessions, the member may not use those photos or videos on any website or social media account connected with the member's campaign. Members violating these provisions could be subject to an ethics complaint filed with the Texas Ethics Commission. This information was provided to all members on March 20th of this year after adoption of the policies and procedures manual by the committee on House Administration. The chair has asked the sergeant's office for assistance in enforcing these requirements. Thank you, members.
is Ms. Howard on the floor of the house. The following amendment, the clerk read the amendment. Amendment by Howard. The chair recognizes Ms. Howard and explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I'm going to try to do this in a way that you can understand me with my limited voice, but I also have uh, Representative Mary Gonzalez here to back me up if I lose it totally. <clears throat> This amendment would ensure that anyone seeking health care services or survivors seeking support at a safe, ready facility for a sexual assault forensic exam could do so without fear of being separated from their family. I do want to thank the author for including a prohibition of enforcement of this, this bill here at schools, houses of worship, healthcare facilities and safe ready facilities. Unfortunately, it limits it to only the person who is seeking those services though in healthcare. To, to give you an idea what this actually means, if a child breaks their arm, this amendment would ensure that a parent who is undocumented can take their child to the hospital. If a sexual assault survivor is seeking uh, a forensic exam at a safe ready facility, their loved one who is undocumented should be able to accompany them. All this amendment does is says that, it strikes the language that says it has to only be the person who is seeking the health care. And I want you to try to imagine if you have children yourselves or grandchildren, or even if you don't, just imagine a child who's been injured, a child who has a severe health care need and needs to go to the hospital, a family member who has been raped and needs to go to get a forensic exam, and you are undocumented. You have to make a choice then. Do you go? and support your child, leave your child alone at the hospital because you might be deported. And think about what that choice is. It's really a nightmarish kind of Sophie's choice because you're choosing to abandon your child there in the hospital and not be present to support them through whatever's going on with their medical situation versus being potentially deported and permanently separated from your child and being able to be there to take care of them. Imagine it's your family member who has been raped and is traumatized and needs to go have that forensic exam and you are there to support them and take them and hold their hand through this very invasive four hour procedure and yet you're undocumented. You have to make a choice. Do you go there with your family member? Do you risk being deported and being separated totally from that family member? Nobody should have to weigh the costs of being a parent or supporting a loved one against deportation. Adopting this amendment should not be a question of politics, but rather a question of affording basic human decency to immigrants and those trying to help them. I urge you to support this amendment and ensure that these healthcare facilities continue to be a safe haven 
for healing and are not weaponized to support a harmful policy. And contrary to what I keep hearing over and over again, children, the intention is not to harm children. If we do not allow the parent to be with their child in healthcare emergencies, children will be harmed. All this is doing is saying, do not separate, do not force separation of children from their parents who may be undocumented. Do not use a healthcare facility as a place to separate families rather than allowing these families to be together, allowing a parent to make the decision to provide the health care necessary for their child. And if there's a speaker up there. I move adoption of the amendment. The chair recognizes Mr. Spiller in opposition to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Members, um, I respectfully oppose this amendment because what we're doing when we limit it this way, um, I, well, I just, I just think it, I think that we, let me put it this way. I think that we provided enough adequate uh, protection here under the exceptions. And so I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, we've, we've tried to be fair, we've tried to be open, and I think that we've properly addressed it, sufficiently addressed it, and so I respectfully oppose it. The chair recognizes Mrs. Gonzalez of El Paso in favor of the amendment. First, I want to thank my colleague, Representative Howard, for her beautiful um, introduction of this very important amendment. Members, if you do not live on the border, while this, while this bill is statewide, it has a higher impact in our border communities. Our border communities are full of very beautiful and compassionate families that are, in many instances, mixed families. If you're a parent or a grandparent, ask yourself, if my child had an emergency and I could not be with them in the hospital, how would I feel? I understand that there is an energy to pass this piece of legislation, but our job as legislators is to protect the most vulnerable. And here we are talking about children, children who are in a hospital, who we know might need their parents. We are just asking for some consideration. Not everything has to be a partisan vote. On some level, we should be able to look beyond partisan politics and say, in this instance, there should be some nuance. Because leadership is about nuance. Leadership is looking at the moments and saying, hey, maybe there should be something different. So just to be very clear, all this amendment does is says, in hospitals, if you are a, if that we are expanding it to not just say, the individual who's getting care, but to their immediate family. That is a very fair request, especially if you live in a community where you know families are going to be impacted, you should be looking at this amendment. Members, we know this bill is going to pass. And if we know this bill is going to pass, please be sure you're not hurting children. Thank you, Representative Howard, for a uh, for, uh, filing this very important amendment, and I really hope the author will reconsider. The chair recognizes Ms. Howard to close on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I, I realize that the author is not planning to accept any amendments. I assume that's just so this thing can move through and regardless of what's in it. And I know he respectfully is not doing that, but I'm respectfully saying that this is going to hurt children and families. This is going to separate families. This is going to prevent children from getting the health care that they need. This is going to prevent people who have been raped from getting the forensic exam because their family member cannot be there with them. And that is a horrific thing to have to go through. So we're willing to send a bill that has this damaging impact without considering adding this amendment 
even if it means it delays things a bit. I can't quite understand that. I respectfully disagree with that premise. I hope that you will consider voting for this amendment and ensuring that our children get the health care they need, that they're not separated from their families, that we don't weaponize our health care facilities. Move adoption. The question occurs on the adoption of the amendment. There's a record vote. The clerk reading the bell. She was Howard voting aye. Ms. Gonzalez of El Paso voting aye. Mr. Spiller voting nay. Mr. Cook voting nay. So Mr. Smith voting nay. Ms. Niabe Crowder voting aye. Ms. Mr. Romero voting aye. Have all members voted? There being 60 ayes and 84 nays, the amendment fell to adopt.
The chair recognizes Mr. Patterson for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I move the previous question on passage to third reading of SB4. This motion requires the seconds of 25 members. The chair has been provided with the written seconds of at least 25 members. The motion is seconded. Three minutes pro and con debate will be allowed on the motion for ordering the previous question. The chair recognizes Ms. Niave Criado against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. What we're dealing with right now is a complete deviation. What is normally dealt with on this floor is we debate bills of such magnitude and statewide ramifications. Our voices are being silenced. The voices of millions of our constituents that we represent are being silenced, and we're not able to lay out amendments on key issues facing our state key issues facing our constituents to try to protect them, to protect, for example, individual survivors of domestic violence. Why were we elected if individuals who are proposing this bill cannot even stand up here and defend the amendments? They cannot defend the bill because you're moving to call the question. What courage do you have? Why are you elected if you can't even stand up here to defend a bill impacting millions of Texans? Why are we elected if you cannot even wait for hours because you're worried about your flight home? Why are we elected if you don't even have los cojones para defender esta propuesta de ley? This legislature, a body that is meant to debate and discuss legislation impacting our constituents, we as members, that's why we're asking you to vote no so that we can have discussion. It's only 6.14 p.m. on a bill of statewide impacting millions of Texans, violating our Constitution, violating the Supremacy Clause of the United States, violating the 14th Amendment, violating the Equal Protection Clause. And as we have amendments to try to protect our people, to try to mitigate the damage that we are causing to millions of Texans through Senate Bill 4, you are silencing the voices by supporting an amendment. And I want to know who signed this motion and who we're asking for strict enforcement on this motion to call the question because we need to know who has the courage or who doesn't have the courage to stand here and debate devastating and overwhelmingly unconstitutional pieces of legislation like Senate Bill 4. We won't be able to have an opportunity to lay out key amendments because you're cutting off our time, you're cutting off our hands, you're cutting off our feet, you're trying to silence our voices on legislation that will essentially create ICE officers and deputize them all across the state so that our community can now be round up, be arrested, and sent back to a border, a port of entry, where a, another country may not even accept our community, and then they will face third-degree felonies because of that. Gentlemen, ladies, time to expire. The chair recognizes Mr. Patterson on the motion. In favor of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, today hasn't been too long of a day, but this is the same bill that we debated till 4 a.m. just a couple of weeks ago. Hours and hours and hours of debate on a bill that is critically important to the future of this state. Our constituents sent us here to ensure that we secure the southern border. And that's what we're gonna do with this bill. Move passage. The question occurs on ordering the previous question on
passage the third reading the SB4. All in favor, vote aye. Opposed, vote nay. This is a record vote. The clerk will ring the bell. Strict enforcement has been requested. Members, please vote from your desk. You may not vote from the dice. And you may not vote for another member. Strict enforcement. Members, please vote from your desk. You have plenty of time. Members, you must vote from your desk. We have plenty of time. Have all members voted? There have been 81 ayes and 57 nays. The previous question is ordered. Ms. Mr. Speaker. M m m for, for purpose, ma'am. Parliamentary inquiry. Uh, please state your inquiry. How many times during the regular session of the 88th legislative session has a motion to call the previous question been brought before the House? That is not a proper parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker? Ms. Nialbe Criado, what purpose? I move that we reduce to writing and have placed in the journal all remarks and debate and discussions on Senate Bill 4 as well as all of its, its amendments. Members of the motion, objection, chair has none sort of. The Mr. Chair, Speaker. Ms. 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 Nialbe Criado, for what purpose? I also move that we reduce to writing and have placed in the journal all remarks and debate and discussions on Senate Bill 3 and, or House Bill 3 and its amendments from earlier today. Senate Bill 3. Senate Bill 3. Did you include the, the motion to um, Yes. Debate? No. What's that? The what? Uh, uh, Mr. All remarks on Senate Bill 3, correct? Correct. correct. Members of the motion, objection, chair, here's none sorted. Mr. Is Speaker. Is the obvious for what purpose? Also move that we reduce to writing and have placed in the journal the debate on the motion to call the previous question as well as the... Yes. That would be included in the previous motion. Thank, Thank you. you. The chair recognizes Mr. Spiller to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, it's been a long day. Uh, I appreciate uh, the, the discussion. And I, uh, I want to say this. I, I understand that there are some that don't like this bill. And I, I understand that. I respect your positions. But I feel it's important that we pass the strongest border security bill that we can. And I think we're on the verge of doing that twice in this Texas House, the strongest border bill in the history of our state and our nation. And members, I thank you for your time, and I move passage. The question occurs on passage of third reading, SB4. This is a record vote. The clerk ring the bell. Mr. Spiller voting aye. Mr. Patterson voting aye. Ms. Wiener voting nay. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There have been 83 hours and 16 days. SB4 has passed the third reading. Members, we are not done yet. We will adjourn for a legislative day and come back in five minutes. The House stand adjourned until 623.
Would the House come to order? Members, please register. Have all members registered? The quorum is present. Mr. Metcalf moves to excuse those members on this legislative day who were excused on the previous legislative day. Is the objection? Chair has done so order. The chair lays out on third reading, SB3, the clerk read the bill. SB3 by Huffman, relating to an appropriation to provide funding for the construction, operation, and maintenance of border barrier infrastructure and border security operations, including funding for additional overtime expenses and costs due to certain increased law enforcement presence. The chair recognizes Mr. Jatan to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the Mr. previous Speaker, chair. Mr. Bryant, for what purpose? I raise a point of order against further consideration of Senate Bill 3 on the grounds that it violates Section Rule 8, Section 4 by changing a general law through an appropriation bill. Please bring your point of order down front.
Mr. Deshaun, you may go ahead and explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this is the bill that was heard earlier dealing with the border, uh, border wall funding and border security funding, and we have an amendment. Thank you. The following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by King of Uvalde. The chair recognizes Mr. King to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is the legislative council of the amendment that we put on on second reading. I move adoption. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there any objection? Chair, here's none. So order. Mr. Chair, recognize. Carrying their infants. Is anyone wishing to speak on, for, or against the bill? Please come forward. Mr. DeChan, is, we're, we're sitting, Ms. Gonzalez, we're waiting to see if anybody wanted to speak on or for, okay? Chair recognizes Mr. DeChan to close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ms. Gonzalez, for what purpose? Does the gentleman yield? Do you yield, Mr. DeChan? Yes, I do. He will. I just have one question. Yes. Um, does your bill provide any reporting and or guardrails um, for the $1.5 billion appropriated to the governor? It provides the same protections that already exist in law for funds used by the governor's trustee programs. There's no additional guardrails or anything put on there. Which means really none. Yes. I, we, I think we have accountability around the funds that goes to the governor's trustees program, and if we needed to find out how things were spent or where it goes, that we have the ability to find that out. And is that your intent as the author? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Move passage. The question occurs on the final passage of SB3. This is a record vote. The clerk ring the bell. Mr. Kane voting on. Ms. Chong voting on. Ms. Davis and Dallas voting nay. Have all members voted? There being 84 ayes and 59 nays, SB3 is finally passed. SB3 is finally passed in accordance with Article 3, Section 49A of the Texas Constitution.